Well, thank you all once again for inviting me back. I always enjoy coming back to St. Elizabeth. And uh, as my students say, they said to me about a month, a uh, couple weeks, no, about a week ago, as a matter of fact, we were having a. Uh, I'm the chaplain of my dorm, so I went from treasurer of the province to chaplain of my dorm. <laughs> so I was having a meeting with all my students, and uh, we were talking about Christmas time and what they did for Christmas, and they said, uh, where, where did you go, Father? And I said, I went to Southern California. And my students said, ah, oh, SoCal. <laughs> did you know that? I've yes. never heard that before. Yes. 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 It's good to be back to SoCal. <laughs> You're so cool. <laughs> I always love coming here. I enjoy the retreats as well, so I look forward. I guess I'll be seeing many of you on the retreat as well as this. And so today, uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, when the well dr runs dry. I don't know if I got the correct topic, because I know we had talked earlier. About I, the Jezebel spirit. The Jezebel spirit. It's going to be included. <laughs> when the well runs dry. <laughs> I guess there's been a little bit of confusion about that. That's not unusual in my life these days. But when the well runs dry, any of you ever feel like you have a hard time praying? Any of you get that experience? The well runs dry. It's, um, it's a common experience, actually. It's uh, been very common, especially uh, to the great saints and the mystics in the history of the church. People always struggle with prayer. We're going to talk about that today. So if you have any of these um, experiences, hopefully it will help you. It was wonderful for me to go through it because I, whenever I don't know what to talk about, I always go back to the Catechism of the Church. Catholic, Catholic, the Catechism kind of lays out everything for you very nicely. So this is a reflection of both uh, my own experiences, maybe your experiences, as well as what the Church teaches about prayer. As I said, it was, um, it's been a common question throughout the history of the Church. I've had so many friends of mine and others say to me, oh, Father, um, I have a hard time praying. What can I do? Do you have any suggestions? Anything you think I should read? What should I do to help me to pray? The disciples of Jesus said the same thing. They said, Jesus teaches how to pray. Just like um, John the Baptist taught his disciples how to pray. So how do we pray? And if you have that question in your mind, don't feel bad. Don't, don't feel as if you're failing or that you're lost or that you're in the desert wandering around. Don't, don't worry about that. Um, it's the right question to ask. So by asking the question, Lord, I would like to pray or how do I pray, you're on the right track already. So this is a, a good thing. And what, what is it? What is, what is the essence of prayer? Um, the essence of prayer, what's it all about? Prayer is fundamentally, it's the lifting up of the heart and the soul to God. Uh, the Catechism, St. Thomas Aquinas also said that prayer is simply gazing at the Lord. It's turning our attention to Jesus. So ultimately, um, what it is, is a turning to the Lord. And first and foremost, it is a gift of grace. Amazing, isn't it? You would think prayer is something that I do, but really, it's a gift of God. And the origin of prayer is from outside of us. The desire to pray, the desire to turn to the Lord, comes from outside of us. It is actually the Holy Spirit within us talking to the Lord. You see, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we've talked about before, are always in communion. They're always communicating with us. And so when the Holy Spirit is in us and dwelling within us, it's communicating. Well, he is communicating with the Father and the Son and invites us to join in that communication, invites us to join in the life of God. And so the Spirit of God is praying within us, and it's drawing us into prayer. So first and foremost, it is a grace of God. So, how does that affect us? 
sisters and brothers, I see at least one guy out there, <laughs> one other guy out there. It is so important that if we want to grow in the life of God, to keep ourselves pure so that we can feel the grace of God calling us to prayer. We want to keep ourselves pure because sin, sin dulls the senses. It dulls our sense of the Holy Spirit. It dulls our sense of grace. So we want to keep ourselves pure. I, I believe um, that there are a lot of priests out there who missed the call to the priesthood for whatever reason. People who get too steeped in sin can miss the right spouse, <laughs> can choose the wrong spouse, can make all kinds, choose the wrong job, make lots of choices. Now, it doesn't mean, I, I see people chuckling, that doesn't excuse <laughs> any of us. But the point is we want to keep ourselves pure so that we can hear and feel the grace of God in our lives, because it is a gift. Prayer, also, beside being a gift, involves our response. The gift of prayer, the grace of prayer, is an invitation to enter into a relationship with God, to gaze at the Lord, to lift up our hearts to Him, and it calls for a response on our part. So it's given to us, and we are called to respond. Now sometimes that response is really, really easy, like, like when I'm in trouble. When I'm in trouble, prayer comes very easy. <laughs> I said, oh Lord, oh Lord, what have I done now? What did I say in class? What did I do? You know? Lord, make those dice go six, six, seven, <laughs> one, one. Lord, please help. Sometimes when we're in trouble, prayer can come very, very easily. Or, as we were doing today, or when I, I entered, you were all singing. And in cases like that, beautiful prayers that you were singing. I mean, it's easy to pray when we're, I mean, it's beautiful. I was just looking at the refiner's fire. I thought, this is really the heart of my, of my talk today. And the words of that song, two songs ago were, purify my heart, let me be as gold and precious silver, refine me, uh, refine my heart's one desire, is to be holy and to be set apart for you, Lord. Those words come from the Holy Spirit. Somebody wrote that. You know, somebody wrote these words. And the Holy Spirit was speaking through this person. I choose to be holy. I choose to be set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. There's no greater prayer than that. I mean, that's, that's the most wonderful prayer there is. Refine my heart. Uh, make me holy. Set me apart. I choose to be holy set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. That's the proper response to the grace of God in our lives. Beautiful song. So when we sing these songs, it's really easy to pray like that. We are in a search. I think I've shared this with you before. Um, the Economics Department of Providence College, where I teach, um, has been going through a big change over the last 10, 15 years. A lot of the faculty are retiring. And so when in, in academe, at the university level, when you hire a faculty member, it's practically for life. It's almost a marriage. You know, you bring somebody in, you get them tenure, and they stay for life. So it's very, very important that we choose the right people. And so we involved in a really big search uh, again this year. and. Uh, and there are pressures in the department because we have, uh, our department tends to be very heavily male. I, I don't know, but I guess women don't like economics. I, 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 how can we possibly not like economics? But it's about a third, about one third of all PhDs are, are female, and that's about where our ratio is. And so there's been a move to increase uh, the number of women in our department, so we, we were able to recruit about five women to come on for, three of which will come on to campus for interviews. But my point is this, um, we were very concerned about this, and so I made it an object of my prayer. Every, I said Mass just about every day 
for our search because we wanted to do something for the college. So when we're in trouble and we have need, um, it's kind of easy to pray to the Lord. But sometimes um, prayer is not so easy. Sometimes it can be very, very difficult. Um, and as I said, many of the mystics in the history of the church talk about uh, some of the difficulties in prayer. We're going we're gonna to review those in a few moments. We're going to go through different ones that maybe you've experienced, that I've experienced, and talk about them. And so sometimes when, there, when prayer is, is, is difficult, we can, we can, you know, drift from prayer. But one of the things that, that I do to help me um, on a day-to-day -day basis is um, the Dominicans, as, as you know, we, we pray every day. We have uh, the liturgy of the hours. So in the morning we get together for about a half hour. We have our prayers. That's followed by Mass, and all of us Dominicans, about 20 of us, or 25, can celebrate every day uh, around the altar. And uh, so about an hour of prayer each day. And one of the things that I've done in order to help me um, is to spend an extra three or four minutes after I receive the Eucharist, to stay right in my seat. Uh, some mystics and saints have said that right after we receive Jesus in the Eucharist, and he comes into our hearts, um, that moment is probably the most precious moment of all, because he's right there in you and in me, right in our hearts. And um, so I try to take that extra five minutes, because I know, I know that as soon as I walk out that door of the chapel, that's it. My life is not my own until I go to bed. <laughs> That's the end of it. So I, so I want to make sure that I take that time right after the Eucharist to let the Holy Spirit soak into my heart and give me one more push. And it's during those moments that I say, Now, Lord, conform me to your will. Conform me to your will. Help me to not get too distracted during the day. Help me to remember you and to keep you in sight, and to treat every student like I would treat you. And that could be hard. That could be really, really hard. Especially when they come up to me and they say, now, Father, I deserve an A for this course. And you sit there and think, oh, boy, here we go. I've got to treat this student like I would treat Jesus. I wonder if Jesus would say that. No. No. So take that time to, especially after the Eucharist, or maybe a little time each day with the Lord in prayer to overcome the difficulties. Why do we face these difficulties? Why do we face difficulties in prayer? Right? One of the reasons, uh, there's two, two fundamental reasons. There are more, I'm sure, but two basic ones. First one is, is ourselves. We are alive, and we have things that we have to do. Uh, we have jobs, and we have obligations, and so that can take up a little bit of space in our minds. And so, if you feel distracted at times, again, don't, don't beat yourself up over it. It just means that you have obligations, you have things to do, and that's just the way life is. So, number one is, is that. Number two, you could be tired. You could actually be tired. And so when you're tired, your mind can wander. And sometimes people even fall asleep during prayer. I get that quite often. You know, they'll say, Father, I want to confess this sin. I fell asleep during prayer. I say, well, you know, okay, but it's, that's not really a sin. You're just tired. You, you fell asleep. And a lot of the times, uh, that sleep could be a gift from God. You know, you've struggled enough. We're going to give you some rest now. So sometimes the difficulties can come from us and our distractions or just being tired. And if you have mental distractions, as our novice director taught us, my first year of religious life, says if you get distracted with all sorts of, of thoughts, he said, don't go crazy over it. Just give it to the Lord and get back to work. <laughs> get back to prayer. So if you get distracted with stuff, just give it to the Lord and go back to prayer. Don't worry too much about it. But finally, the next reason um, is that we are in a battle with evil. And everyone, if there's one thing Satan does not want you to do, 
Satan does not want you to pray. And so you're going to be tempted. Some, some temptations are going to be natural, just natural stuff. But other times, it's going to be actually Satan trying to distract you. And some of his words would sound like this. Uh, you have way, way, way too much to do right now. You, you, have to, you just have to go and, and do these other things. And don't bother with that because you could take care of that later. What's really important is that you go take care of these other things. So you got to be, we have to be real careful about that. And even the church teaches that we are in a battle with evil. And I believe in Satan, and the church believes in Satan, and Satan is real, and he is going to tempt you, and he's going to try to distract you and me from our prayer lives. So don't get obsessed over it, but just keep it in the back of your mind. Each day, as you get ready to go to prayer, overcome the temptation to either stay in bed or do something else. Make the time for prayer and be faithful to that time. So, common difficulties that we might experience, distractions, as I said before, some natural, some, some diabol diabolical. In each case, we want to be very careful. Sometimes people feel, or maybe you felt, I know I felt this way, that we're a failure, <laughs> that we're a failure at prayer. We're not good at it. Uh, other people are better than, than me. I remember speaking to one lady many, many years ago uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, she had come in for spiritual direction after going to confession. I was talking to her, and I said, so, like, do you spend time in prayer each day? She said, no. And I said, why not? And she says, well, I don't know what to say. What do I say to God? I said, oh, my. I said, just, just talk to the Lord like you talk to a friend. She says, well, it's just nothing very profound. So sometimes people think they're not good enough. And so we have to start really from scratch, saying, well, start by a little conversation with the Lord, gave her a rosary, said, try this, just recite the rosary, put yourself in the presence of God. And, um, and she tried it, and it started to work, because I got transferred eventually, so I don't know what the follow-up was. But you might have those feelings, like perhaps uh, you or I or we're a failure at prayer. Don't, don't, let, that, don't let that overcome you. Um, nobody can fail at prayer. If there's one thing that we can do, it's that. Uh, so never, never worry about that. Sometimes we might feel a certain dryness in our lives. I mean, a real, a real distaste for prayer. Don't want to do it very distasteful to us. The mystics talked about this. Mother Teresa talked about this. Uh, many, many of the saints have gone through this kind of dryness. If you are experiencing that, it's often called the desert. Uh, some people call it the dark night of the soul. There's all sorts of, of things, that, different kinds of descriptions. I've experienced it. You know, you go through it. And why am I bothering? Why am I bothering with this? You know, why am I doing this? Is I, I was I was speaking to a priest. Just uh, he's older than me. So believe it or not, <laughs> he's older than me. I never thought I would ever say it like that. But, so he's really old. And, uh, <laughs> And we were just talking about a week ago, I had, I had visited with him over in, um, in San Francisco uh, a couple of weeks ago when I came in to visit with my family. And then he went back east to, to visit with me because he teaches at Berkeley. And uh, so we, we were talking about, about the spiritual life, you know. And that was one of the things, you know, he was talking about that she was, um, it's really hard. This guy, this, had been, this is a man who had been a good, good, good holy priest. Talk about holy priest. This guy is the image of it. And yet he struggles sometimes with prayer. So we talked about those struggles. It can happen to anybody. And it's just a dryness in uh, the spiritual life. Uh, perhaps you might, I've heard this before, maybe you feel like you have too much. Maybe I've heard people say, well, I... I have too much. I have too much money, and I have a nice house, and I have all these things, and I, I should give it all away, you know, and follow Jesus. There's always that temptation. 
I always tell them, oh, if you gave it all away to follow Jesus, your children would starve. <laughs> your husband would leave you. <laughs> you, know, you. You would have nothing left. I mean, these things are good. To have money and house and a good life is not evil at all. It's just part of your vocation. You need that in order to serve the Lord and serve those around you. And so because you might be doing okay and have things, that doesn't mean that you're not a good Christian um, or that you're not able to pray or you're not holy. Not, not at all. One thing that I've heard quite a bit, and I think I've experienced it myself, uh, is a disappointment in our prayer lives. Perhaps we feel that um, our prayers have not been answered. They've not been answered yet. Perhaps they've not been answered the way we would like them to be answered. And so it can be, it can be a, a, a temptation sometimes to feel that um, we're not getting what we asked for, and perhaps, perhaps we're wasting our time doing that. But I just want to remember, uh, remind all of us, including myself, that um, in terms of disappointment, remember that the call to prayer is really a call for all of us to simply turn our hearts and our minds to the Lord and to let Him transform us. The essence of prayer is not just to get what we're asking for, but the essence of prayer is to allow God to transform us from within. So although we may not see or know the good that is happening, um, just know that God is transforming us through our prayer. So if I pray for you, I am transformed. You're transformed too, but I am also transformed. If I pray for somebody else, I'm transformed. And so we, we remind ourselves of that. Although we may not get what we're looking for or hoping for, uh, we are being changed and conformed to Christ. And for I've always felt that that's a consolation for me. You know, if I feel like a failure in prayer, at least I remember, well, I'm praying to the Lord, I'm being helped, I'm being made holy, I'm being transformed. Finally, probably, uh, well not finally for the talk, but the last big thing I want to talk about is the most dangerous of them all. And it's called sloth. Sloth. Now we use the term sloth in day-to-day -day language in a way that usually refers to laziness. Like, oh I'm slothful, I have not cleaned my office today. And I'm slothful, I didn't pick up after myself. Or, I'm slothful and I feel lazy, so I took a couch day and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I'm slothful because I slept in or whatever I did. But we think of sloth as being laziness, uh, being, you know, not clean, not whatever. That's probably the world's view of sloth. But that is not what we mean when we're talking, when the mystics talked about sloth. That is not what is meant when the church talks about sloth, when the church calls it one of the seven deadly sins, right? One of the seven de it is not a deadly sin to keep your room messy, because I would be, bye-bye, I'd be in big trouble. No. Sloth, the, the deadly sin that we're talking about, is laziness in the spiritual life. And that's, that's, that can be a real problem. What are some of the signs of sloth? Well, the desire to not pray, okay, and giving into it. So I don't feel like praying today, I've got too much to do. You know, look at the time, oh my God, I've got to pick up the kids, I've got to do this, that, prepare my classes, whatever. I don't have time to pray. And so day after day after day after day after day, we don't pray. It's like going without food. You can only do that so long. It is a deadly sin. Uh, people stop going to church. That's one of the big things. You know, I, I, I can find God on the golf course. Well, okay, you can. Uh, you can find God in a lot of places. But the Catholic Church has said, we want you to go to church at least one day a week, the Sabbath Sunday, for us. It's to help us avoid the sin of sloth. Uh, spiritual laziness, spiritual laziness, um, neglect of spiritual things can lead us 
to spiritual death. So that is something that um, I think is, is, we should remember. I'll talk more about that in a couple of moments. And so sloth can lead to a loss of faith. And we can lose our faith. I, I feel so sad as I know good people. I know very good people. Excellent people. Uh, kind people. That's the best people you're ever going to meet have no faith. You say, you know, you are living the Christian life. You are, you know, the poster boy or poster girl for the Christian life. And they don't, they've lost their faith. Um, and what happens, of course, we lose our faith. We start praying. We cut off, we cut off uh, the grace that can give us the fullness of life. That's the real, that's the sadness of thinking, boy, if, this guy or this woman is happy now. Think of how happy they could be if they would open their hearts to the Lord. The Lord would just fill them with grace and blessings. It wouldn't be a perfect life, but they would be even happier than they are now. And we can lose our faith through sloth. That's why it's so, so dangerous. Sloth can lead us to lose the desire for God. We can even stop desiring it, not even want God. I see this happening to people, you know. I, um, don't, you, don't you believe in God? No, I don't. <coughs> you want to? Not really. Uh, how about, you know, the good life? No, nah, I'm fine. Yeah, just not there. The desire is gone. And so, we don't want sloth to, to harm us, to kill uh, the Spirit of God within us. So, what would be our good responses to these difficulties? How can we avoid these problems that come our way? Well, first thing I just say is just remember that the purpose of prayer is the transformation of your own soul, the transformation of our own souls. So, as we're going to be praying in a few minutes, I believe, for I mean, a basket of, of, of prayer intentions. I'm going to put myself in the basket, <laughs> put my intentions right in there. Uh, so as we pray for these intentions, we remember that we're opening up our hearts to the Lord. We're turning our gaze to God. And as I say in my morning prayer, Lord, I open up the floodgates to you. So I'm opening the floodgates of my heart. Fill me with your grace and transform me. I say that almost every morning, you know, to... to for my own good and, and for the good of others, all those I, I come into contact with. So we remember that we are transformed through our prayers, whether we feel that they're beneficial or not. Uh, second thing to remember is this. Our prayers, every single prayer that we utter, no matter how small, no matter how big, every prayer is efficacious. Mm -hmm. Efficacious, I had... Uh, one priest gave us a homily at Providence College a while back, and he said, every prayer is infallible. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what he meant by that, but I, <laughs> he said, every prayer is infallible. I thought, well, I, I said, okay, I, I can go with it. But what he meant to say was that every single prayer, regardless of our condition, regardless of our sinfulness, regardless of everything, every prayer will be answered. It will be heard, and it will be answered. Somewhere in the Old Testament, I really should have marked it in my Bible, but I, I did not. I believe it's in one of the wisdom, well, in part of the wisdom literature, and it says that a prayer is like an arrow, you know, in the, in the hand of a, of a warrior, hand of a person. And, you know, they shoot the arrow into the sky, and it says every prayer is like an arrow shot into the sky, and it will not rest until it reaches the heart of God. Prayer, that arrow is going, looking, looking for God behind the curtains, and, and it will not rest until it reaches the heart of God. And so every prayer is like that. Every prayer is efficacious. Therefore, <laughs> therefore, because they are so powerful, even the small ones, even if we're steeped in sin, whatever, Every prayer is so powerful that we are obliged to pray. We are obliged to pray. 
It is our responsibility to pray. It is our, that's why at church, every Mass, we pray for the Pope, and the bishops, the priests, and all the leaders of the church, and the sick, and the dying, and the dead. It is our obligation. Because they are so powerful, we have a responsibility to pray. And so we pray for ourselves, of course. We pray first for ourselves, that we be transformed. And then we pray for everybody in need, everybody in this room, and all of our friends and our family. Every prayer will be heard, every prayer will be answered, and grace will flow into the heart and the lives of every single person we pray for. And that's a powerful thing. And so I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, um, in the morning, when I have to get up, I get up, whatever, same time as all of you, about 5.30-ish. And get ready for <laughs> oh, you get up later than that? Yes. Yeah. That's cool, I can't wait. But get up, go off to prayers. Sometimes I want to sleep in, stay in bed. And I'll tell you, a lot of times I get out of that bed because I'm thinking it is my duty. It is my duty. I don't want to, I don't feel like it. Um, I'd rather sleep, I'm dead tired, blah, blah, blah. But I have, I have an obligation to the Lord, and I have an obligation to my fellow people in the world to get up and go and pray for them. So it helps me. It helps me get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> pray for others because your prayers are efficacious, every single one. And that's the teaching of the church, and it's in the catechism. You go read it. I'll give you the numbers if you want it. So don't feel as if they're not, even if you don't feel like praying. Um, next, we pray not out of obligation, but we pray out of charity. We pray out of charity for others, especially those in purgatory, those people who are in, and we, we believe in purgatory, those people making their way to the Lord, they have unfinished business, that's what I say. They die, still have some unfinished business, some sin that needs to be taken care of. They need some more purification. This is the teaching of the church. I believe it. I'm so happy. I love purgatory. I am depending on it. Please, don't take away purgatory. Because I don't know if I'm going to make it. I need the help. And so people with unfinished business need our prayers. And so um, I started charity, out of obligation and out of charity. If we really love those who have gone before us, we pray for them. Uh, my mother died in, gee, about maybe 20 years ago. And my sister died about 10 years ago. My father died two years ago. And I, you know, I pray for them, even though they may be in paradise. I say, just in case. And I say, Lord, if they don't need it, I'll take those prayers. You know, <laughs> send them right back to me. You know, do I get reimbursed? <laughs> so pray for those who have gone before us. And they pray for you too. So that we're all praying for each other. Because those prayers are <laughs> efficacious. Next. Vigilance. How do we overcome the difficulties in prayer? And the answer, well, one of the answers is vigilance. Do not give up. Do not give up. I'm sure you don't. And this is a word of encouragement for you, because I'm sure you're doing all of this. I'm sure all these things are just, you know, kind of a, a reminder for you. But be vigilant, because it is consi consistency is the root of success in life and in the spiritual life as well. You know, it's every single day. And you know what? My life always, always goes better when I spend time in prayer each day. Always. That is a guarantee. And if you don't believe me, stop praying for a few days. Let me know how it goes. Let's <laughs> we'll see how that works for you. <laughs> you know? Don't give up every day. And it doesn't take much. Just go. Go to prayer um, each day. Set up time and be this of vigilance. It is through vigilance that you will grow and mature in the spiritual life. And boy, prayer is the door for that. And finally, um, <coughs> prayer is the best uh, medicine to avoid sin. 
You know, by keeping the grace of God in our hearts and in our minds, when we see evil, we're going to find it a little more distasteful. You know, we may be tempted to evil, part of our lives, we know that. But by keeping the grace of God in us, um, we keep those floodgates open. Say, Lord, fill me with your grace. Uh, fill me with all the things that we sang about in this song. Set me apart. I choose to be holy, uh, ready to do your will. We keep praying those, those beautiful, beautiful words. And he'll come in and he will do that. And he's going to make us sensitive to the good. As a matter of fact, St. Thomas taught, and the church teaches as well, both teach, that by allowing God's grace into our hearts, and we're going to talk about this more on the, on the retreat um, coming up, is that he actually fine-tunes our will, all right, our, our will to choose the good. So we're going to see evil, we, we see it every day, and although we may want to, it's like I, I walked by a, a box of chocolates this morning, and I said, keep walking, Bill. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> Ignore that box of chocolate, you know. I, I'm staying with Father Don right now, and he, I, think he, I think he likes chocolates. <laughs> I said, keep walking. Well, we're going to see evil, you know, all around us, and we just, we just keep walking. We just keep, keep going on the right path. And, that, and, and prayer is, is, helps us to do that. As a matter of fact, uh, it's, it's, it's almost kind of bold, but the, cat, uh, the, the church teaches that prayer is inseparable from the Christian life. We cannot say that we're Christians and do not pray. You know? We cannot say that we're Christians and do not participate in, in daily or weekly Mass, whatever. So, remember that it's transforming you. Remember that the power of, of God is efficacious. Your prayers are transforming you, transforming others. Remember to be vigilant, and remember that it helps us all, you and I, to avoid sin, and that it is inseparable from the Christian life. So now I'm going to wrap it up with a couple of suggestions. Okay, good, good. So I uh, kept it around 30, 35. Maybe not a month, but we'll, get, we'll work on that. So how can you how can you do it? And we I think we all know the way. I always suggest number one is uh, daily mass if you can get to it. I know not everybody can. People people have to work, of course. So daily mass and daily Eucharist, if you can possibly get there. Because again, and we know this, as we receive Christ in our hearts, he comes in, he makes his dwelling place within us, fills us with his grace, and transforms us into become more like him. So we're empowered, we're strengthened to overcome whatever, whatever temptations to evil may come our way. Life is, life is easier if we start with, with Mass, if we can get to it. Uh, stay close to the sacraments. I have here a note, um, confession. So if we, if we go to Mass, we want to receive the Eucharist. If we need to go to confession, go. Go to confession. Don't, don't worry about it. Just go to confession. I'm sure Father Michael or whatever priest around be happy to hear your confession. Go uh, clean the slate, give yourselves to the Lord, and let the grace of the sacrament come into your heart. And that will, that will help you in your prayer lives as well. Same thing with me. Next, all kinds of, there's all kinds of helps available to us all. So that when, we're, when the well runs dry and we don't feel like praying, pick up the rosary. Uh, there are rosaries here in the church. There are little pamphlets on how to say the rosary. Um, don't have to work too hard. Just take the time to pray the rosary as another help. We also, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy is said daily here. I believe it's every day here, yes. uh, right after Mass, so you can plug into the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Um, another suggestion for you that might be of help is read the Scriptures. Um, my father read the Scriptures all the time. He, he would read it from cover to cover. And he was retired, so he had the time. He didn't do that when he was working, but when he was retired, he would read it, and you know, and he, he would talk about Job. <laughs> he always talked about Job and how he complained for 40 chapters. <laughs> so, 
it's, it's true. It complained for 40 chapters. 40 chapters. Maybe maybe more. <laughs> but they had to cut them off in 40. <laughs> so the scriptures uh, is the word of God. I mean, boy, you know, it's, it's, it's a powerful, it's Christ himself in the word. Um, also, something that was probably you don't hear much about, but I often recommend, because I, I like it, I, I do this a lot, is read the lives of the saints. Those are always fun. They have, I think they have some in the library here, uh, their lives of the saints, like every day there's a saint. So when, I, when I'm on to preach, I always go to my lives of the saints to see who the saint of the day is. And then I decide whether I'm going to talk about, you know, the, the, you know, the New Testament or the Old Testament or the saint of the day. And people love the saints of the day. And I, what I like about it, and the church highly recommends that because we can see ourselves in the saints. Uh, we see ourselves. So we see the difficulties that they have, that they have overcome and the difficult lives um, that they lived. I, I just read, I was reading uh, the encyclical, Pope Benedict XVI's encyclical on hope as I was preparing for this weekend's retreat. And in, the, in this, boy, Pope Benedict XVI, I just discovered his writings recently. This guy, I mean, it, it can be a little scholarly, maybe a little dry, but boy, if, if, you, can, if you have a taste for that sort of stuff, he is really, really good. He's got some good stuff out there. I, I highly recommend it. So when I was looking uh, for things to talk about on, on the retreat, I came across this encyclical on hope, and so I opened it up, and I thought, wow, I couldn't, couldn't put it down. It was so good. But, um, oh, so he talked about the lives of a saint. I don't remember her name. I'd have to go back and look it up, but it was um, this African, I believe it was African girl from, from the Sudan who was... Um, had no particular faith at all, uh, was sold into slavery over and over and over again, and she was beaten regularly by her different owners until uh, and w one of her owners was so was so cruel that they scarred her. I guess that's, that's and this is like in the last 150 years. This is not 2,000 years ago. They scarred her body and put salt in the wound as they scarred her. Yeah, I mean, who does this, right? And so she undergoes all this, this, this suffering from her, her owners until eventually uh, she ended up being bought, I guess, by a, a Christian. Maybe it might have been a Greek Orthodox, but it was a Christian. And they brought her over to wherever they lived out of the Sudan. And she was introduced to the Christian faith. And if you read the story, you can look it up. I'll see if I can get the name for you. Is it Paquita? Um, yeah. 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 You send that? That's the same. Josephine Margaret. Paquita? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you know the story. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Then I'll just, I'll just end it right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, was, she was sold. And, and, and then the, uh, I, if, I, if I miss something, let me know. But just what I read briefly to a Christian. And then um, they wanted to bring her back to the Sudan, and she begged to be able to stay in her new home. Uh, she got baptized, and she was confirmed. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this woman was beaten regularly throughout her whole life, mm -hmm. right? And scarred, okay? And so she was known <laughs> for her kindness and her good disposition. Mm -hmm. She did not hate God or blame God for anything. And she became a confirmed, good Catholic, joined the convent, became a sister, and was the porter. You know, that the porter was the job nobody wants. That's the job I have. I'm the guest master of Trumpets. <laughs> I'm the porter. It's the job nobody wants, you know, to answer the doors and make sure that they're all taken care of. And that's how she spent her life. If anybody could have been angry with God, it could have been her. But this is where the grace of God comes in. And we see this in the lives of the saints. Well, the grace of the God came into her life, changed her disposition, gave her a love for her neighbor, a love for God, and a love of service. 
And what a wonderful example of hope that she is. So, Lives of the Saints and other spiritual readings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, that's my message for you today. Um, if you're in a dry place, if you're having a difficult time, don't give up. Um, use all the tools and the gifts that the Lord has given to you to help you to pray. Be vigilant and always remember, always remember that little arrow, you know, seeking out the heart of God. Every prayer we utter uh, will be heard. Every prayer will be heard and it will be answered. And whether we know it or not, we will be transformed and others will be helped. All right. thank, you, thank you all very much.